I am the director of the Division of Policy Communication and Outreach at the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy, or ODEP, as you probably are familiar with that term. Uh, I have been at the Department of Labor a oh, pretty long time. I've been at ODEP about seven years, and before that had uh, worked for the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, or OFCCP, uh, as their communications director. And before that, I was with the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Policy, where I was working on helping employers establish drug and alcohol-free workplaces. So I uh, really, really enjoyed my work at the department, seeing uh, uh, help for employers and employees from a lot of different angles. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to comment that I, I know that we're all navigating uncharted territories right now, and we're working hard to keep ourselves and others safe and well. And before I jump into the presentation, I just wanted to point out that DOL and its technical assistance centers are posting a great deal of information about COVID-19 to help you understand how best to help your employers or, or your employees rather, while also keeping your business activities moving forward successfully. Um, I'm gonna touch on this a bit more in a minute when I get to our technical assistance centers, but I just uh, couldn't really go any further without just kind of recognizing what's all out in front of us right now. Um, also, on a more positive note, I wanted to give a shout out to CVS, who I believe is on the line today, and also Pepsi for winning the Department of Labor's inaugural Excellence in Disability Inclusion Gold Award. So the Excellence in Disability Inclusion Award, or as we're fondly calling it, the Eddie Award, uh, was new this year, a new venture that uh, ODEP uh, embarked on with OFCCP the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, to recognize a federal contractor that's really going above and beyond in disability inclusion. So like I said, this is our first year, our inaugural, inaugural award, and congrats to CVS and Pepsi for, for winning that award. So today I'm gonna to talk about some key resources and campaigns we have going on to promote the employment of people with disabilities and then I'm gonna talk about strategies and techniques you can use to bolster your hiring for diversity um, and your efforts that you're putting into place to build inclusive workplace cultures that ultimately help you benefit from the tremendous talent out there that exists among people with disabilities. So just in case you're not familiar with ODEP, we were established in 2001. And as I mentioned, we're a part of the Department of Labor. We are not regulatory, so we're actually the only non-regulatory federal agency that promotes policies and coordinates with employers and all levels of government to increase workplace success for people with disabilities. And our mission is to develop and influence policies that increase the number and quality of employment opportunities for people with disabilities. And so to advance this mission, we coordinate both internally within the Department of Labor, for example, working with the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, but also we coordinate externally uh, with other government agencies, nonprofits, employers, and employer groups. And in, in this spirit, uh, we're pleased to partner with get, getting hired for today's webinar. So clearly 2020 is gonna be remembered for a lot of things, not all of them welcome. I mean, who could have imagined back in the fall when we were planning for the next year, uh, what we would be dealing with. But again, on the positive side, this year is the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA. So throughout 2020, the Department of Labor has wanted to be out front celebrating through a variety of events and collaborative activities and we're centering it all around the theme of increasing access and opportunity. So in case you're unaware, the ADA was signed into law on July 26, 1990 by the late President George H.W. Bush. It's a landmark civil rights legislation that works to increase the inclusion of people with disabilities in many areas, including employment, state and local government services, public accommodations, for example, like places like movie theaters, stores, and the doctor's offices, and also in telecommunications. It has five sections called titles that relate to different areas of life. 
in Title I of the ADA addresses employment. While ODEP was, um, does not enforce the ADA, every year we provide technical assistance to tens of thousands of individuals and employers on the law's employment provisions. And there are two agencies within DOL that do enforce parts of the ADA. Uh, OFCCP, which I mentioned earlier, has coordinating authority under the uh, employment-related provisions of the ADA, and our Civil Rights Center is responsible for enforcing Title II of the ADA as it applies to workforce-related practices of state and local governments and other public entities. So, more importantly, in the spirit of the law, um, I should say that, that really this touches the work of the entire department. Um, and we work really hard to ensure all American workers can prepare for and succeed in employment. So in short, at the U.S. Department of Labor, we're committed to delivering on the promise of the ADA for not only today's workers with disabilities, but also future generations. We're really excited to celebrate this anniversary and we hope you'll join us in doing so. So you might be asking, how can my organization join in the celebration? Well, this slide presents a few ideas on how you could do that, but there really are so many different ways that you can highlight the anniversary in your company's communications, both internally and externally. So you could issue a press release expressing your organization's commitment to the ADA and actions you've taken to create a disability inclusive organization. Another approach to this might be to try to publish an op-ed by your company's leaders uh, you could feature the anniversary in an internal and external communications, including your public-facing websites and social media platforms. And if we do, we hope you'll use hashtag ADA30. You could conduct employee training on disability inclusion, covering topics such as disability etiquette and responsible, or I'm sorry, reasonable accommodation policies and procedures. A variety of ready-to-use materials are available to help you, including several from the Job Accommodation Network, uh, the Employer Assistance and Resource Network on Disability Inclusion, which we call EARN, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, and the Campaign for Disability Employment, which I'll also share more about in a minute. I will share, um, so in addition or alternatively, you can invite representatives from a local disability service provider or the Center for Independent Living to speak as part of any of the trainings that you might think about doing. So the anniversary represents an opportune time to also review your company's policies to ensure they convey a commitment to a disability inclusive culture and update and disseminate them as needed. You could host an event, likely around the actual anniversary in July, and this might be done through your company's employee resource group um, if no such ERG exists, then you, this might be a good time to create one. And I know in current times, uh, we might be needing to think about virtual events. You could also do something as simple as create a display about the anniversary and disability employment history. So we are planning to post a website that uh, reviews uh, disability employment history in a timeline. Uh, we'll, we're hoping to get that up soon, so you can stay tuned to our website, which I'll give you uh, the address later for that. Um, we're also planning to have a poster that you could order and, and share, um, and electronic versions of that as well. Um, we, uh, so, like I said, just, just stay tuned for that. And then lastly, um, the adaanniversary.org website is an awesome website with a media kit and a whole lot of ways uh, or ideas on how to, to celebrate the anniversary. The ADA um, network is the sponsor of this website and they are funded uh, through the Department of Health and Human Services. So now it's important to note that the ADA is about more than compliance and legal responsibilities. It's, it really has fundamentally altered the way individuals with disabilities think about finding, securing, and maintaining employment, and the way that we ensure that they can put their skills and talents to work. So factors such as advances in technology and ensuing policies have spurred employers to recognize disability inclusion as not just a policy issue, but also a smart workforce strategy. Through ODEP's employer-focused work, we work to further advance this paradigm shift, and supporting us are, the, are many employers. And I know by virtue of you tuning in today that you're among them 
and you're committed to being disability inclusive. So helping employers understand and meet their responsibilities benefits both of us in advancing our mission and, in, and individual companies. And that's because disability is an important dimension of workplace diversity, and we know that diversity adds value. How do we know that? Well, we know it through evidence um, that is both instinctual and empirical. So while many of us intuitively understand the case for workplace inclusion, a growing body of research outlines the argument for it in strictly business terms. So for example, the study published by McKinsey and Company a few years ago revealed that companies with greater inclusion practices among their leadership teams are more likely to have financial returns above their industry's means. This outcome may be attributed to the presence of diverse perspectives on how to solve problems and achieve business success. And among those diverse perspectives are those of people with disabilities, and there are more than 30 million people uh, who have disabilities of working age across the U.S. There's also this, uh, evidence of the benefits associated with disability inclusion in particular. For instance, a report released last year by Accenture, which was based on data gleaned from the Disability Equality Index Survey, and that's a survey that's given by Disability In, which is formerly known as the U.S. Business Leadership Network. So this survey said that companies that improve disability inclusion over time outperform those that don't. Specifically, companies identified as leaders in disability inclusion had, on average, over a four-year period, 28% higher revenue, double the net income, and 30% higher economic profit margins than their counterparts not on the list. So now I'd like to take uh, to talk a little a bit about what actually makes a workplace disability inclusive. The foundation for our work with employers is something we call inclusion at work. So this is an employer policy framework we developed in collaboration with our employer technical assistance center called the Employer Assistance and Resource Network on Disability Inclusion, or EARN for short, as I mentioned earlier. To create it, we gathered input from a range of employers with exemplary track records in disability employment. Inclusion at Work outlines seven core components of a disability inclusive workplace, along with a menu of strategies for achieving them. These seven steps are illustrated on the wheel, and I'd like to run through each component sharing what it is and offer a few examples. But really, the examples can go on from there, and the website has a great deal more information than what I'm gonna to cover today, so I invite you to check it out. So the first piece of our wheel is lead the way, inclusive business culture. So what do we mean by this? Well, the foundation for a disability inclusive work environment is an inclusive business culture, and it starts with commitment at the highest levels. So communicating such a commitment is especially important when companies want to encourage applicants and employees with disabilities to self-identify, whether that be because of regulatory requirements, such as those um, that are required under Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act and the ones that OFCCP enforces, or a voluntarily adopted affirmative action program. So some examples for fostering an inclusive business culture may include expressly integrating the disability into company-wide diversity and inclusion statements and initiatives, formal expressions of commitment from the, the highest parts of your leadership, having a disability-focused employee resource group or affinity group um, and or disability employment champion, or conducting employee engagement surveys to gather input on whether the workplace environment is accessible and inclusive for you. The next piece of our wheel is build the pipeline outreach and recruitment. And I know this topic is probably of strong interest to many getting hired partners. Although many companies want to hire people with disabilities, some say the, they experience trouble finding qualified candidates. So the key is proactive outreach and recruitment. And to effectively build a pipeline of applicants with disabilities, you, um, you really want to work on the relationships with a variety of sources. So these relationships may include formal partnership agreements, or they may simply comprise of ongoing contact regarding job openings and candidates. Regardless of the approach, the investment will be worth the effort, and your company will not only access talent it may otherwise have overlooked, but also benefit from supports that can help with retention. So just to get at that a little bit more, 
Um, here's a quick list of some recruitment sources that can help in both reaching your goals for disability inclusion and illustrating a good faith effort to do so. I know many of you are federal contractors, and as you likely know, the Section 503 requires covered entities, namely federal contractors and subcontractors, to take affirmative action to hire people with disabilities. And the 2014 updates strengthened these requirements, creating for the first time ever measurable goals. So, while many companies have shared that they're doing this, they said that one of the greatest barriers they face is the inability to find qualified candidates with disabilities. So one great resource is Disability Student Services and or Career Student Services, um, the offices at local colleges and universities, and perhaps even local um, universities. Don't forget those, your community colleges, et cetera. Um, these offices can be of tremendous support and they want to hear from you. And working with state and local service providers can also be key to helping you find quali qualified candidates with disabilities. For example, you have the American Job Centers or the AJCs. These centers located in communities throughout the country offer centralized employment and training services to help people both with and without disabilities prepare for and obtain employment. AJCs also help businesses recruit and hire qualified people with disabilities. Then you have the Centers for Independent Living, or SILs, or sometimes ILCs for Independent Living Centers. They're community-based nonprofit agencies, and they're run by and for people with disabilities. They provide a variety of services, including those related to employment, and they can help employers find qualified candidates with disabilities and provide advice on employment supports, such as transportation and technology, that may impact an employer's ability to hire, retain, and advance people with disabilities. And you've also got employment networks, or ENs. They're private organizations or public agencies that have agreed to provide employment and vocational rehabilitation services and other types of support to beneficiaries with disabilities under the Social Security Administration's Ticket to Work program. Employers um, can contact one or more ENs in their area to let them know they are interested in employing people with disabilities and discuss the skills they need. And then we also have the Council of State Administrators and Vocational Rehabilitation Network, or the C Savers, or the, the NET. I know, I know you guys are like just probably dying from all these acronyms. We in the government love to use them. Uh, this is a nationwide network of business consultants that serve as employers' points of contact for, for voc rehab, the primary system of services and resources that specifically address the employment needs of individuals with disabilities. And then there are also job posting websites and job fairs that target people with disabilities. And one example, of course, is gettinghired.com. All right, moving on. The next component, component of our Inclusion at Work framework wheel is hire and keep the best talent acquisition and retention processes. And I know this step is also likely to interest many of you tuning in today. So this means that in addition to taking steps to attract and recruit qualified individuals with disabilities, businesses committed to increasing disability inclusion should review their policies and processes across the employment life cycle to ensure they facilitate the hiring, retention, and advancement of individuals with disabilities, uh, and not forgetting our disabled veterans too. Um, so such policies and processes uh, may address accommodations, qualification standards, job announcements, hiring processes, special initiatives for youth, career development and advancement, and retention and promotion. So some, some good examples for best practices with disability inclusive talent acquisition and retention might be, you could adopt a promotion policy that, that includes disability among positive selection factors. You could ensure representation of existing employees with disabilities in the onboarding process for example, as part of orientation presentations and welcome committees, that really would make an out-of-the-gate impression. Um, you could include language about how to request reasonable accommodations in notices about professional development opportunities. Or you could maintain employee assistance programs, or EAPs, and disability management and prevention programs, also known as stay-at-work, return-to-work programs. And if you're interested in more about that, you can look for that topic on ODEP's website that we've been um, researching and developing quite a bit of materials in that area. 
So the next piece of our wheel is ensure productivity reasonable accommodations. As I'm sure you understand, all employees need the right tools and work environment to effectively perform their jobs. Similarly, individuals with disabilities may need workplace adjustments or accommodations to maximize their productivity. So under disability non-discrimination laws, including the ADA and Section 503, a reasonable accommodation is considered any modification or adjustment to a job or work environment that enables a qualified person with a disability to apply for or perform a job. So some examples here for providing reasonable accommodations might be that you could adopt and communicate written reasonable accommodation policies and procedures for processing requests. You could establish an administrative mechanism for minimizing the cost of an accommodation being assigned to a line manager's budget. So we call this centralized accommodation fund. So that would be that um, instead of a, a particular manager finding the money within their allocated budget, the company would already have a centralized accommodation fund that they could draw from. We're seeing success with that across companies. Um, you could also have a central source of expertise, like a, a specific individual or office that can offer input on assessing, evaluating, and providing reasonable accommodations. So before we move on to our next piece, I just want to make sure you know about a key technical assistance resource, our Job Accommodation Network, or JAN. So JAN is funded by ODEP. Um, hopefully many of you are already familiar with JAN, but just in case not, it's the leading source of free expert and confidential guidance on workplace accommodations and the employment provisions of the ADA. It offers a, just an incredible set of resources on its website, as well as one-on-one -on -one consultation with individual employers about individual situations over the phone. And the phone number is on their website, but in case you want it right now, it's 1-800-526-7234. Um, your employees can call Jan as well. Um, and I also want to just point out two things. One is that Jan does a, a survey each year of the people that contact Jan for, for guidance. And they ask them about the cost of the reasonable accommodations that they put in place. And 59% of, or they have found that 59% of the accommodations cost nothing, while the median one-time expenditure for those that do is $500. So this is an expense that most employers report pays for itself many times over through reduced insurance and training costs and increased productivity. So I just share that with you in case you, that factoid helps you uh, with your internal um, efforts. And then I, the other thing I wanted to mention about Jan is they have been posting some very helpful information related to COVID-19. Um, so if you are looking for information that specifically relates to um, people with disabilities, you can check our website. Uh, we are uh, we are linking to DOL's resources on it right now and we'll be very soon posting disability employment related resources. Um, but Jan already has some up. They, uh, they also have what's called situations and solutions where they're presenting specific guidance uh, um, that relate to actual calls that they're getting that are related to COVID-19. And they have posted a blog that, uh, that gets into a lot of details about the Family and Medical Leave Act, the ADA, and things that employers might be having on their minds about how to address COVID-19 when with regard to uh, in supporting employees with disabilities. Okay, the next component of our wheel, and we're rounding the wheel here, is communication of company policies and procedures. So as this name suggests, um, this means that to attract qualified individuals with disabilities, a company should really communicate its commitment to employing them, both externally and internally. And this commitment goes beyond just formal statements. It includes efforts such as internal campaigns, disability inclusive marketing, vendor communication, and participation in disability-related job fairs and awareness events. So, um, so some examples here could be that you could incorporate disability imagery into your advertising and marketing materials, both uh, general and employment related. And you know, what the, an example that comes to my mind here is uh, my oldest son is a senior in high school. And when we went through the college uh, search process, 
we would go to the website and diversity really matters to him quite a bit. And I noticed many college websites really didn't demonstrate diversity across race, gender, and disability on their main pages. But a lot of them would have a tab that, you know, up in the, the menu on the, the website that would be, you know, diverse, diversity or, you know, diversity matters to us. And you click there and suddenly you see all of this diversity. But it's all just on one tab on their website. And I think uh, many corporations may fall into that um, bad habit as well. So you just might want to consider whether you're really infusing uh, disability inclusive images throughout your materials and your websites because people with disabilities, they're going to look for that. And when they see that, they will say, this is a company I feel like is welcoming of me and I'm interested in working there. You might also inform local disability organizations about company sponsored career days. You might distribu distribute information about relevant disability policies and priorities to your subcontractors, your vendors, your suppliers, and request their support. Um, and you may even make this a, a, a requirement in the contracts that you have with them, that they also employ people with disabilities. And you might also publicize the company's commitment through internal communications channels like uh, your company intranet uh, or your employee newsletters or magazines. And before I move on to the next piece of our wheel, I just wanted to say that one really easy way to communi communicate a commitment to disability inclusion is to observe National Disability Employment Awareness Month, or NDEAM for short, which is held each October. As all of us know, every day people with disabilities can and do add value to America's workplaces and economy, and they add value to your companies and to your clients. But during NDEAM, we celebrate the contributions of workers with disabilities. And we also reaffirm our commitment to ensuring all Americans, including Americans with disabilities, can gain skills and put them to work for the benefit of themselves, their families, their employers, and their communities and our nation's economy. So every year we create a new theme for NDEAM, and this year we're gonna join with the ADA 30 uh, theme that the Department of Labor is using. And so for ending this year, we're using increasing access and, and opportunity as our theme. Um, coincidentally, this is a, also a big year for ending and it is celebrating its 75th anniversary. So uh, the, first official actually, for, the first official effort actually began back in 1945. And it took a few different iterations along the way. And when ODEP was established in 2001, it assumed responsibility for the annual observance. So as part of this, each year, ODEP typically works with its partner organizations, including those representing employers, um, people with disabilities and their families. And we develop an annual theme uh, because we really want to get a theme that works for you all, That that you can use in your materials and in your internal communications campaigns. So we want the, the theme to be relevant to the topics that are, that are important to you in that particular year. We usually then uh, involve that theme in the development of a poster, as I mentioned, and we want this year for the poster to reflect both NDEAM and ADA 30. It's going through, we, we actually have one designed and it's going through our clearances right now um, attentions are on other things right now, but we hope to kind of, you know, right size the ship that's definitely been uh, tilted a bit as all of our ships have been tilted and get back to being able to produce these materials once we know that, um, that our other work is under control. Um, so we hope that that will be available early or early or soon, I want to say. And um, you also can stay tuned to these materials on our website at dol.gov slash NDEAM. Um, all right, moving along, we have the next part of the Inclusion at Work framework is called Accessible Information and Communication Technology. So obviously today, accessibility is not just a physical concept. Being able to get through the literal door is no longer enough to ensure people with disabilities can apply and interview for jobs. A company's virtual door must be open as well. So furthermore, once on the job, employees with disabilities, like all employees, must be able to access the information and communication technology. So we call that information and communication technology, ICT. Um, and they need that to maximize their productivity. So some examples of best practices here are 
using accessible online recruiting platforms and products, adopting a website or an ICT accessibility policy, uh, maybe appointing a chief accessibility officer. And you could also establish a clear procurement policy specifying that ICT should be accessible, indicate which standards apply, and provide for inspection of deliverables based on those standards. So a key resource related to accessible technology is ODEP's Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology, another acronym for you. We try to make them easy to remember, so we call this one PEAT. And PEAT has a variety of tools for employers to learn about the topic and, and assess the accessibility of their IT infrastructure, their websites, and the like. Um, if you haven't checked out PEAT, I really encourage you to do so. They've got um, amazing checklists that you can really just apply to your website and see whether you might be inadvertently closing that virtual door to people that you really want to be hiring. And our last piece of the wheel is accountability and self-identification. So what do we mean by this? We mean that while the adoption of policies and procedures around disability employment are essential, ultimately a company must take steps to ensure their effective implementation. So for federal contractors and subcontractors, reporting requirements under Section 503 of the Rehab Act provide some of the framework for measuring results with regard to data collection. However, companies can take additional steps to ensure disability becomes institutionalized in their workforce diversity goals. And, if, and really, when it's appropriate, they can encourage self-identification. So some examples of best practices for accountability and self-identification might be that you provide ongoing training on disability-related issues to all staff, particularly those involved in recruitment, hiring, promotion, and retention. You might establish accountability measures and ensure an efficient and accessible process for self-ID, um, as is required for federal contractors or you might incorporate disability inclusion goals in appropriate personnel's performance plans. So while on the topic of, um, of self-ID, I wanted to let you know about a new guide we recently put out or that EARN put out. Uh, it's called Engaging Employees to Measure Success, Innovative Approaches to Encouraging Self-Identification of Disability. So this guide provides ideas for how to counter what research has shown to be the five main barriers to self-ID of, of disability. So these five barriers, I'll just run through quickly, are the risk of being fired or not hired or promoted. So someone might not self-ID because of the risk of being treated or viewed differently by colleagues and supervisors, um, their desire for privacy, uh, the risk of losing healthcare benefits, and the knowledge that the disability has no impact on their job performance. So in addition to strategies to help mitigate each of these apprehensions, the guide includes approaches some businesses have used to increase self-ID rates and track resulting progress, basically in internal campaigns to encourage self-ID. This guide was published by EARN and ODEP in collaboration with one of ODEP's alliance partners, which is the National Industry Liaison Group, or NILG. I think probably many of you are members of the NILG. Um, and this can really be a valuable resource for businesses of all sizes interested in assessing their progress toward disability inclusion goals. As some of you know, NILG is an employer association on affirmative action and equal employment opportunity. And we work closely with them to help federal contractors meet their responsibilities related to disability inclusion in particular. So ending with accountability and self-identification, those are the seven pieces that make up our inclusive, uh, I'm sorry, our inclusion network framework. And like I said, even though it sounds like I just covered a lot, um, I really only scratched the tip. And if you go to askearn.org, you will see a great deal more information on uh, best practices and strategies. But I also wanted to share with you some resources that are less technical in nature and more about communicating your commitment to disability inclusion within your company. One of our key communications initiatives within ODEP is called the Campaign for Disability Employment. And I mentioned them at the, the beginning of my presentation. Um, the Campaign for Disability Employment, or what we call the CDE, takes a broad brush approach to raising awareness about this issue. So this campaign is a public-private collaboration with leading business and disability organizations. 
And it is policy driven in that it reflects uh, the priority policies that we have at ODEP, but it also communicates these priorities through personal and positive stories and imagery. Um, so it's about the why this matters to all employers and all Americans. The campaign's activities have revolved around a series of PSAs, which also have accompanying materials for use in the workplace. And you can access them at whatcanyoudocampaign.org. And it's also possible that maybe you've seen some of these on TV. That is our main um, channel that we try to have them aired on is in uh, is available space that TV stations have. So of the four PSAs, two, which are I can and who I am, have particular relevance to your work as talent acquisition professionals. And we have a range of supporting materials, including posters and discussion guides that you might find of use in your workplaces. Um, you can use these to conduct employee education or perhaps spark discussion around um, hiring with your, uh, with your hiring managers. So I can features seven people with disabilities sharing what they can do when given the opportunity. Its primary message is at work, it's what people can do, not can't do, that matters. And who I am touches upon the issue of disability and identity, noting that disability is a part, but not all of what makes a person who they are. In this way, it touches upon the issue of self ID without calling it such, of course. So, um, if there are any fans of Breaking Bad out there, you might notice that one of the people who took, took part in the PSA is RJ Mitty, AKA Walt Jr. or Flynn. Uh, we were so honored to have him lend his star power to the campaign. He's been a great spokesperson on this issue, particularly related to increasing the visibility of people with disabilities in his industry of entertainment. And he takes pride in his identity as an actor and as a person with disability. So he actually has cerebral palsy. He was not acting um, like a person with a disability in the show. So looking forward, we want all people with disabilities to feel proud of who they are, all of their identities. To circle back to this year's important anniversary, the ADA ushered in a new era of opportunity for Americans with disabilities to do so. It said that people with disabilities have equal rights to the many freedoms most people take for granted, including, very importantly, the opportunity to work. From there, the foundation was laid for a more inclusive workforce. Also, it's important to note that the ADA was modeled on the Civil Rights Act and the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 which as you know, also prohibits discrimination in employment on the basis of disability, but only for certain subsets of employers, such as federal agencies and federal contractors. So in this way, federal contractors have been out in front on disability inclusion, helping pave the way for all companies to understand how to increase it, and from understanding the benefits of doing so for them and our nation at large. So President George H.W. Bush emphasized this in the remarks he delivered when he signed the ADA in 1990, and his sentiments still ring true today. And I'm particularly struck by what he said to the business community that day. He said, you have in your hands the key to the success of this act, for you can unlock a splendid resource of untapped human potential that when freed will enrich us all. So I'd like to close today by saying thank you for helping me to talk, or helping all of us to unlock that potential for fostering inclusion and for advancing the spirit of the ADA in your workplaces and beyond. And then I just uh, wanted to stick this slide in here with a number of resources that I've covered today for learning and assistance. I thought you might like to have them all in one place. We have the Office of Disability Employment Policy. We have EARN, the Employer Assistance and Resource Network on Disability Inclusion. We have JAN, or the Job Accommodation Network. Um, PEATE, the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology. NBEAM, the National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And the resources from the ADA National Network that I mentioned. So with that, I will kick it back over to Sarah to see if there are any questions about what I've covered or any issues that didn't come up in my presentation, and I thank you very much. Yes, great, Renee, thank you so much. No issues whatsoever. I think there's a lot of great content and 
very timely as well, especially with everything that's happening right now with COVID-19. People with disabilities and this population is more relevant than ever. One, just because I think there's a lot of fear and we're hearing this even from our own job seekers about how are people with disabilities going to be viewed um, as employees? Will they be treated any differently in terms of how how the company is responding to this and this is a real fear that we want to share with everybody you know some employees with disabilities if there are layoffs happening they have a greater fear that maybe that might be held against them um, or they might be viewed differently than somebody without a disability but at the same time there are some companies that we know of that have an increase in hiring right now um, and trying to meet some hiring demands and needs. And so people with disabilities may especially be looking for contract work, part-time work um, for a number of reasons. And so this is a great population uh, to really be looking at and taking advantage of in terms of available talent. And overall for us to remember that a disability could really be anyone at any time because disabilities can be acquired. Um, there could be, you know, heaven forbid, but if somebody did have COVID-19 and they had some symptoms or long-term effects from that after recovery, depending on that situation, it could be a situation in which they need to request an accommodation now moving forward. And so that could now be something that they identify as potentially a disability or a condition in which they need an accommodation in the workplace. So just making it as relevant as possible to everything happening right now, despite a lot of the uncertainty and some of the craziness happening that we really need to be focusing as much as possible on our sensitivity, our inclusion efforts, those messages that we're sending out. So Renee, I wanted to thank you again and to, to really piggyback off of what you were saying with all of these different areas that employers could be focusing on for disability inclusion and those seven, seven different segments that you covered today, do you recommend or feel like there is one good place to start from there? Um, I know it, it might feel like a lot for everyone to try to tackle all seven pieces at one time, but even taking a look at the ADA 30 that's coming up and ending that's going to be here before we know it, um, especially since we're really relying on technology right now, do you feel like branding and taking advantage of marketing and messages that are being put out there, even on social media channels, would be a really good place to start? Well, that certainly would be reassuring to the disability community, I would say. Um, I would say what we're seeing uh, through virtual listening sessions right now and a lot of the, the um, things in the media, you can tell that people with disabilities are worried that they will not be rolled into a lot of the new laws that are being put in place, that they'll be thought of as an afterthought and, and addressed later. And um, so I think that if, if companies did come out with messaging now, um, that would probably be very reassuring. And uh, we were, our, our, com our economy was so strong um, before COVID hit that that was creating wonderful opportunities for people with disabilities because talent was short out there. And uh, so to find more talent, we were seeing such great opportunity to remind employers of where the talent exists and to fill some of those talent gaps that, that we've been hearing about. Um, now there's great fear that with so many um, layoffs and furloughs that, that people with disabilities won't be thought of for the talent pool. So um, I would also recommend as another place to be starting is for companies to be looking at their policies and considering um, where they need to be updated or reshared with everyone so, so that people do know um, what their rights and responsibilities are with the company and the processes that they might need to take to, to ask for a reasonable accommodation. Um, and then, yeah, not only having those external messages through social media, but also, and, and, and through regular uses of the media, but also then internal um, messaging where, again, it brings the entire company together. We're all in this together, and we want to remember all the aspects of, the, of our diverse staff um, and that everyone feels that, that they're being represented in those internal com uh, communications. 
Absolutely. And to go along with what you're saying in terms of company policies, I just want to reiterate again, and we can always send it out afterwards to all the attendees on the line today, just the JAN resource and the EEOC resource as well. Those are fantastic resources for everybody. They include real life scenarios that both organizations have been receiving and questions from employers and organizations on what they can and can't ask or what they what can they do in particular situations. Even a question like if an employer is hiring, can it screen applicants for symptoms of COVID-19? Is that allowed? And covered by ADA, is that something that we can do? And the answer is yes, an employer can screen job, job applicants for symptoms of COVID-19 after making a conditional job offer, as long as it does so for all entering employees of the same job type. Um, and this ADA rule applies whether or not the applicant has a disability. So that's just one example of guidance that is provided by the EEOC itself and by JAN as a great resource. So we can send this out again in case you haven't received it or if you have just a reminder of two places to turn in addition to everything else that Renee has presented on behalf of ODEP. Um, and, Renee, and I wanted to, into, yes. I was going to interject there that um, be, you know, beyond also just these resources and looking on Jan's website, just a reminder that they do take uh, calls, uh, also online um, uh, inquiries, and you can then ask your, que your question very specifically to your workplace. Maybe there's some nuances or, or specific concerns, and they have a staff full of experts that will listen to those specific concerns and provide the specific guidance for you. And that is still happening even in, uh, they are based out of West Virginia. The governor there has folks uh, has asked folks not to leave their homes, but Jan is set up and is taking calls and providing, still providing that one-on-one -on -one assistance. That's great to know. And you had mentioned as well, NDEAM 2020 and how that theme is trying to align with ADA 30. Can you just reiterate, was there a theme actually decided for for NDEAM 2020? And if so, what is that? Yes, we, we have not uh, issued a news release on this, but I can tell you I am 99.9% .9 sure that, the, that this year's theme will be in line with the uh, ADA 30 theme and that's increasing access and opportunity. Um, and we want to bring that together, uh, not only formally with the theme, but also visually on the poster and that NDM is celebrating 75 years of an anniversary. And so we, we, have, we have a plan in place to bring these two together. We're just uh, kind of needing to work through some of our clearance channels, uh, which are a little bit held up right now with everyone responding to, uh, to the, the more pressing needs around COVID-19. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think that's really helpful to know for everyone just to keep in the back of our minds and having those themes align with one another just makes it that much easier to, to plan for it. Is there anything else just, again, given the current state of what we have with COVID-19 and uh, hiring people with disabilities, retaining people with disabilities, making sure that we are still keeping inclusion in mind and in all honesty compliance in mind as well to make sure that we are treating all employees equally. Uh, is there anything else that you feel we should reiterate or that should be mentioned that you want everyone to walk away with from today's presentation? Um, one other thought is uh, mental health and knowing that you know, for all of us that that is an area that may be compromised as we go through this uh, national, well, global crisis, and uh, that we want to support our employees and ourselves and, and kind of do checks on our mental health. Um, we do have a toolkit that, again, EARN has uh, produced that helps uh, folks to understand how to have um, workplace cultures that are supportive of those who might be dealing with mental health issues. And it's, it's a, a really tremendous kit that's broken into parts with, again, with these strategies and, and best practices. Um, EARN also will be uh, having a webinar about mental health issues and COVID-19 on April 1st. And um, I believe that they are promoting that already, but it, it, will, be, uh, it will also be posted on their website after it occurs. 
And uh, so that will be something that you, you will be able to go and watch uh, whether or not you can make the April 1st presentation. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. And those are all of the questions and I think great recap from you, additional advice, extremely helpful. If anyone has any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to us directly at Getting Hired. We'd be happy to forward your questions on to Renee or answer those ourselves. Um, we wanted to provide a reminder as well that this presentation is being recorded. We will send out the link to the recording as soon as it is available instead of sending out the presentation deck. But Renee, I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to give this information, present this information, especially with everything going on today. For everybody on the line, we hope that you all are staying safe and healthy and everybody is able to navigate through this, um, especially with your loved ones and with your teams. If you need anything, we are here to support you. We're here to help in any way that we possibly can, but I hope that everybody has a wonderful rest of your day and Renee, I just wanted to thank you again. Thank you so much. I'm so impressed with getting hired for pulling us all together in these circumstances and our ability to use technology in this extremely productive way. Thank you. Of course. All right.